introduction. Uh, my name is Kevin Kaja. I'm the ultrasound fellow here at Metro Health. And this is our Thursday education time that we do every week. Uh, so, you know, the link we just put in the chat for you guys to, to our YouTube channel to follow us, give us a follow. Uh, one of my favorite attendings from residency has now joined us, Dr. Gazelle. Um, so it's good to see some familiar faces that uh, are now all in different places. Uh, but one of the things that I have taken a liking to kind of towards the end of residency and now really here at Metro Health is doing these nerve blocks. Uh, here at Metro, uh, compared to where I did residency, we have a little different trauma population and that is really the population that if you want to learn these you know, techniques uh, is who's going to provide you with the most opportunity. Uh, so we're going to talk about uh, the way I kind of set this up is to try to almost find every region of the body minus like the head and neck because a nerve block for that is like intubation. Um, every part of the body, I want to try to give you guys techniques to do a block and treat people's pain. Uh, and we'll be as evidence-based as I can with some of these things. And then others is uh, more, others are more anecdotal. Uh, so the, the reference here for the You Break I block is those, those pop-up stores, like the You Break I Fix Your Phone. Uh, I don't know why, but that just came to mind. Uh, I envision like one day a traveling service of nerve blocks to to places to, to fix these problems. Uh, so we have different you know, injuries, mostly bony, uh, to all different parts of the body there. So we're gonna address all that stuff. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm always self-deprecating. You can't laugh at anyone else if you can't laugh at yourself. Uh, so that's me in college with my ears pierced. Uh, but who I am now is my daughter, Blake, uh, two and a half going on probably 18 and a half uh, as her language explodes and she learns how to tell me no more and more. Uh, and then my son, Mr. Miles, he's 10 months old. And that's the fam with the pups in the middle. So disclosures, I wish I had some. I don't, unfortunately. Uh, objectives. So supplies that you need for your different blocks, indications are why you would do them, and techniques. So depending on the block, the technique and the supplies are going to be different. For some of the blocks, they're plain blocks, or you're instilling your anesthetic between two layers of fascia and wanting that to spread uh, to cover certain nerves that you know, are in control of sensation to the areas that you want to block. Now, those blocks, because you think about how they work, require more volume. Uh, so we're going to go over a whole bunch of different ones. And these are going to give you guys your techniques to numb everyone's body and not give them last, you know, which we'll also talk about. So with nerve blocks, like Bill Nye, every time I think about it, how I got started or why I got, like eventually picked up my volume of doing this, it was like hearing Bill Nye talk about inertia uh, and like, what the hell? Like that doesn't really go along with nerve blocks, but there was like a, there was an impedance that I had to overcome. When I started doing this about kind of being not nervous or anxious about doing it, but worried like, oh, am I, can I really do this? It's, is it complicated? Uh, and does it take a while? especially if you're in the busy, you know, in the middle of a busy clinical shift, do you have time uh, to turn your attention away from all your other patients? But once you start doing these things uh, slowly, one at a time, uh, you get quicker and quicker and you're more easily, you know, willing to, to jump into the next type of block. And whether that's, you know, self-educated uh, looking on YouTube or all the different resources that there are for blocks, which I'll give you guys at the end uh, to just pull up on your phone beforehand. Uh, once it, you know, once you do these, it just comes down to, do you know where to look with your probe? 
and get that view that you need to find the nerve. Because after that, it's just putting a needle somewhere. And you're or everyone's capable of doing that. We do procedures, you know, ultrasound guided needle based procedures all the time. Um, you know, we put in you know, dozens to hundreds of central lines and catheters, dep you know, depending on where you are at your, your level of practice. So I initially made this whole talk for our residency here. It was only about a couple of different blocks that we do. Uh, and those of you who know me, I really like resident education and something that I want to be involved in for my career. So I took a look at what our literature says different places are doing around the country. Uh, some of you will recognize uh, Arun Nagdev's name uh, out at Highland. He's, I don't know if pioneer is the right word, but that's the word I use. Or, you know, he's like a ad really strong advocate for nerve blocks, and they have great education online uh, for nerve blocks. Uh, so him and this group did a kind of like a survey of all the residencies at the large academic institutions, uh, over a hundred and I believe it was 170 something places replied out of 200 ish. And 84% of them said that they expect their residents to know how to do nerve blocks. Uh, the most common blocks that they found are forearm blocks. And they also found that it's highly variable depending on where you do residency, while they may expect you to do them or want you to do them, how many you actually get to do. Um, Sandy said, you can see my presenter view. I don't know how to change it. So bear with me. Maybe I switch screens. Does anyone have any advice? Try the swap presenter and slideshow view all the way up there at the top. That actually doesn't work on uh, on Zoom, but Kevin, if you'd go to advanced share, there's a place where you can share a portion of your screen and then you just highlight the portion that you want us to see and not the next slide piece of it. I don't really need, there, is that better? I don't need the presenter view. I... Perfect. All right, sounds great. So the most common blocks that residents do are forearm blocks. Uh, oftentimes these are, in, are initially taught as just landmark guided. Uh, and we'll talk about the issues with that and why ultrasound is uh, a little bit better. Granted, we're all biased about that. Well, most of us are biased. Uh, and then what I found interesting and what I've run into is that do you have to, as a physician, kind of have permission uh, to do these things, to take care of your patients in, in the best way that you know how. Uh, most places, a vast majority of places, don't currently have agreements um, with their you know, orthopedic or trauma services as to who they can and can't do these blocks for. There are some caveats to when you actually probably should allow the specialty services to know that this is happening, uh, and we will also speak about that. Uh, the main concern is that it, it, is a patient going to develop compartment syndrome of whatever area you're going to block and the patient's not going to be able to tell you because you were so great at doing your block. All right, so the supplies that you need. Uh, there are some videos in here and depending on how the internet is feeling and which direction the wind is blowing, the video may or may not work perfectly. So your first supply, typically it wants me to click on it, uh, is a physician. Uh, this is one of our interns. Uh, he's a great guy. Uh, this is a nurse. So uh, plain blocks. As I mentioned, you're instilling a large amount of volume. So you're doing this uh, as in a st sterile technique, as sterile as you can. But in order to instill these volumes, you need someone to push the meds. Uh, so it doesn't have to be a nurse. It could be another physician, a tech, or you know, anyone that has a capable hand that can squeeze. Uh, an ultrasound machine. These are the machines that we use here in our department. And then the supplies that you need. So here is, this was more for our residents and showing them where we get our supplies. Uh, we have nerve block baggies that have most of our supplies where, that we use in the like one place. So you can see all the different things listed in our little kit. Uh, and the other two or just we keep them in a Pixis, and then uh, the back storage room has a lot of stuff. 
So our kits contain two sets of sterile drapes, so you can make a field depending on where you are, your sterile probe cover, chloroprep, the 30 ml syringe, uh, and that's because, again, you're doing a volume block, an 18 gauge needle to draw out your local. We just st stock a two and a half inch spinal. It's good for most of your blocks. Obviously, different body habituses can change that, uh, so you just would need to know where to find uh, your different needles. And then what I like to do is I grab a bag of saline, a small bag, 150 cc's, whatever, and a set of gravity tubing and a flush. So what you do is after you prepare your needle, uh, you have, this is our, where our gravity tubing is, uh, and gloves. So after you prepare your needle, uh, and you're sterile, your field's ready, your probe's on, you have your assistant or whoever's helping you connect your gravity tubing that's been spiked into this 100 cc bag. And that gives you ports where you can inject things through. So in order to, before you instill your local, and this is a good technique for all of the different blocks, I like to use saline first to assure that I'm in the right spot because I don't want to waste like a, a drop of any of the local anesthetic. I want to make sure it gets to where it needs to go. So you have these different ports on your tubing that whoever's helping you can either you know switch on and off, keep the local on one, keep the flush on the other. In particular with one of the you know the fascia iliaca block that we're going to talk about, sometimes in larger people it can be hard to see the plane that you need. So sometimes it takes a decent amount of saline to assure that you're in the right plot in the right place. So if you run out of 10 cc's from your flush, all you have to do is occlude your downstream line and then draw more saline out of the bag uh, that you've primed. So it gives you plenty of fluid to work with. And it also creates a closed system and uh, you can not inject any air into the patient either. All right, so the first block we're talking about, um, femur fractures, um, for the fascia iliaca block. You can do it landmark guided and feel guided where you can feel the two pops of the two different fascial layers that you have to go through in order to inject your local. Um, but we'll just leave it at that with the air quotes. So any anterior thigh problem, uh, any femoral fracture, uh, those are the things that you're going to want to do for this. You know, if you have someone that injects and is an IV you know, drug user, injects in their thigh, gets a large abscess, uh, that's something you could do here. A you know, any type of lack that you need to repair that's large or complex wound, uh, those are things that you want to think about this block for. Interestingly enough, I know I'm not allowed to talk about uh, certain questions that you get on certain exams, but in the fall, I took a pretty big exam, um, just for fun, of course, and one of my questions, the answer happened to be what nerves this block covered, and femoral nerve was not a choice, but lateral femoral cutaneous nerve was. So I think it just signified to me that, oh, this is like, it's being tested on, so maybe it's actually important and, and our specialty as a whole wants you know, people to, to know about it. So this should really be the standard of care in all patients that have uh, proximal femur slash hip uh, fractures. This won't cover your ili the iliac bone, so this is really just the proximal femurs that we consider hip fractures. And of course, you know, no one really truly cares about if that's my opinion or not. So you want to have information to say why. So let's go through some things. So first is pain control, right? Everyone wants pain control. It's the 12th vital sign. It's important to everybody. Um, not only is it important to the patient first and foremost, it's going to be it's going to be helpful to your nurse. So the patient's not having to continuously repeatedly ask for pain meds. So then the nurse has to come find you and then you say you'll do it and then you forget about it because you have 15 other patients and they have to approach you five more times. Uh, not that that's ever happened. Uh, secondly, uh, all the data, most of the data, not all, suggests that patients have better ambulatory scores and abilities at a year out from injury uh, when they undergo a block for this type of injury in the hospital, particularly the proximal femurs. And then this is where 
uh, you know, while the first two are more, these are also patient centered, but maybe, you know, patient oriented. The first two are really patient oriented. What's the patient going to care about? Do they hurt and can they walk again? Uh, these two are big for not just the patient, but the hospital. So if you're going to have less con you know, concurrent pneumonias, less UTIs, and less in your length of stay. The data is not uh, ubiquitously in agreement about this, but these are the three things that most often uh, have been found to uh, be improved in this patient population once when they get a block. So I really find that putting all that together, like it's not really arguable. And it's something that when the patient comes in, especially if they've you know, they come to the ED and then they're in the ED for two days, depending on everyone's boarding and staffing situation. It is, this is our kind of scope of care and responsibility to do for our patients. So where are you looking? So ultrasounds, we have the ultrasound I showed you, the machine we have, it's so good that this is what it does uh, when you look at people, um, which it doesn't. But I don't know why as AI is getting better, I think one day maybe we'll get to this where it just like tell, shows you in a cartoon schematic uh, where everything is. So this would be a patient's left hip. Uh, you can know from you know your navel, nerve artery vein, lateral to medial. Uh, so you're putting your probe down on the patient's left hip, uh, finding the femoral artery, and then you wanna see the sartorius come in, muscle come in on the side. And then that big chunk is your iliopsoas muscle. So here, can you guys see the arrows, the, the cursor? Yeah, we can see it. All right, so yeah. here, this person, this is our sartorius up here. And down here is their iliopsoas muscle. And you have fascial plane here and here. This is the artery. You can tell it's thicker walled. So our goal, is to get anesthetic under here. And we're talking volume, we're talking 30 cc's. Um, you can do more than 30 cc's, you can do up to 40 uh, to really make sure that you cover as many uh, of those nerves that come off the, the femoral nerve as possible. Uh, and then the nerve bundle sits all in here. So the nice thing about the, the plane blocks is that I just I just need to get a needle here and put in fluid and it'll work. And so what's that's gonna look like? So here, what you see is your arrow, the black is separating the sartorius in this person from the iliopsoas down here. So this person, when they were doing their block, they first were above the fascial plane. So they've put fluid up around the sartorius and they corrected it to get the needle below the fascia iliaca down here. So now you see the hypoechoic fluid tracking towards the artery and you have your nerve bundle here. And with any block or all of these blocks before you're injecting anything, you always do a negative aspiration to make sure you're not in a blood vessel. That's the last thing you wanna do. You can laugh, I know you're all laughing. All right, so the second block. So we're still on the leg. So we've covered the femur down to the knee. Now we want the lower leg. So the easiest thing for the most of the lower leg, except the medial aspect is gonna be your popliteal sciatic. So you're going in your popliteal fossa, but more cephalad. You can see here, you start in your popliteal. So you see your vein, your artery, real easy to find. At that point, you've already, most, most patients' anatomy, they will already have split until they're tibial and common peroneal. So you just, excuse me, slide up and you'll see these two bundles, this and this, slide together into the, kind of one conglomerate. So these dark hypoechoic areas are your nerves. This nerve in particular has a multiple uh, fascial sheaths to it. It, is, it has a lot of fascia around it. So it does, when you do inject it, you will feel a little more pressure. But all you do is once you see that, 
you take your needle coming from the lateral, you can come from the medial aspect, but typically it's easiest to come from the lateral aspect. And you have your bundle here. Your needle comes from the side. It's only a few centimeters. And you wanna kind of pop under here. So you're instilling your anesthetic around your nerves. And you can see as you instill the anesthetic, it pushes your nerves down. So you're, you're underneath at least one of the fascial planes because it's moving these nerves. And you just instill 20 cc's. Uh, there's no there's no evidence-based amount that is the most correct, uh, but most techniques that are you know, available for you guys to read about will, will hover around 20 cc's. All right, our next block. Uh, we're onto the chest, the serratus anterior plane block. So we're still doing higher volumes to cover a lot of areas. This is for people that have anterior lateral chest wounds. Um, it doesn't always cover the pleura. So this is not necessarily something that you do prior to a chest tube. But interestingly enough, if your patients have a lot of pain after a chest tube, you can do this block and it'll help them. So those are your branches of uh, your dermatomes that will cover there as well. And that's your nerve. So this block is used widely in other specialties and breast surgery it's used and for VATS procedures it's used and it's well researched and it's become here more popular in our field for patients that have a lot of rib fractures. Uh, it has improved pain scores, less uh, incidences of pneumonia, uh, no reason not to do it uh, on your patients with rib fractures rib fractures, especially a lot of those populations tend to be you know, elderly people. You don't necessarily want to you know, pound them with Dilaudid uh, and really depress their respiratory drive. So then you're kind of fighting yourself. So in order to do this, you just have the patient lay on their side. They don't have to be on their side. They could be flat on their back as well uh, if they have other injuries that preclude them from laying on their side. And you're at your mid-axillary line at the level of the nipple, you know, fourth or fifth rib uh, intercostal space. Uh, probe is pointing towards the patient's uh, anterior chest. And once again, the cartoon schematic, just because I like to look at this before I look at the ultrasound image so I could try to match them up. There are two techniques. Uh, the first option uh, where you're anterior to the serratus uh, is the easiest option because it's the most superficial. Very occasionally, you, patients will have a thoracodorsal artery that is really anterior towards the end of the lat. Um, I have yet to see one, uh, but if you want to kind of be safe when you do this, you can look for it and you just use color to find it uh, to make sure that you're nowhere near it. Uh, you're still gonna have a negative aspiration before you inject any local, so it shouldn't matter. But you know, if you're curious, that's the only kind of potential hazard here. So what does it look like on ultrasound? So this is prior to any type of injection. So you wanna find your rib, your serratus muscle sits on top of the rib, and then you wanna inject uh, your anesthetic on top of that serratus muscle. And here, you also can have your needle come from either side. So if you're, you can have your needle come from anterior or posterior, uh, either way is appropriate and fine. So it's just let your patient's body habitus kind of dictate uh, how you're gonna approach it. And when you instill your fluid, you'll see that pocket of fluid open up. And the more you instill, again, a volume block, because it's a plain block, you're not necessarily gonna see it expand this way, uh, kind of in an anterior posterior direction, but it'll expand in a, like a cephalad to caudal direction. Um, and it'll go up the side of the chest wall and down the side of the chest wall. Keeping with rib fractures, because that block does not cover posterior rib fractures, it's just anterior lateral chest. If you have someone with posterior rib fractures, this is the plain block you're gonna do. So this is also what I didn't know until maybe a week or so ago, is that people with vertebral compression fractures or you know, vertebral body fractures, this can help them. Uh, and you can do this in people that haven't been, you know, are still in spinal precautions that haven't been cleared because they can lay on their side and you can do this block uh, 
in uh, like a lateral decubitus position as well. They don't have to be sitting upright. So you, you will get some coverage of the abdominal wall as the anesthetic goes down the plane. Uh, you don't get coverage of the anterior chest. So you just have to kind of warn people that you might lose sensation to your belly uh, on the, just the ipsilateral side. So with this, you start with your probe within two centimeters of midline, and you'll see those three muscle layers there and your transverse process. Around T5, the rhomboid will no longer be in the picture because it ends. So you'll just have two if you go below it. I like to, there's two ways. You can start medial or you can start lateral. I like to start lateral and just fan laterally and you'll see a rib. And as you fan medially, that rib will dive down and then you'll get something, another hyperechoic structure with you know posterior shadowing. That is a transverse process. For me, that's the easiest way to know that's a, where the transverse process is because I can see a rib, disappears, and then something else comes up. That's, a, that's the transverse process. It can't be anything else. So once you find that, all this procedure is is putting a needle on it and injecting fluid. Uh, it's really basic. The only awkward part is the hand positioning. So how are you going to do it? Uh, so you oftentimes, most of the time, I've done it coming from above. It's still an in-plane technique where you're following your needle down. It's just a different kind of movement than I think many of us are used to. Uh, again, you're only going through muscle, and if you stay relatively shallow uh, with regards to your target to hit the bone, uh, there really is like a, there's a pretty low risk of a pneumo or something like that. You're also going to get spread uh, once you instill another 30 cc's of lidocaine, or not lidocaine, excuse me, of local anesthetic. We'll talk about the types in a little bit. You're going to get spread uh, in both directions, anywhere from three to five dermatomes uh, either way. So I typically will, if they have multiple rib, say if they have multiple posterior rib fractures, and when I did a couple weeks ago, a uh, patient had four rib fractures. I just chose one of the middle ones as my target in terms of level and injected the, there and they got coverage. Uh, they actually were discharged from the emergency department and they never came back. So I'm gonna assume that it was probably the best pain relief they've ever had in their life, something like that, but it definitely worked, right? All right, so moving on to the arm. Uh, so this, as I mentioned earlier, is the most common block that residents actually do. Uh, I haven't done very many, but if you have a devastating hand injury, like the first image of a person that was holding a firework to, as it exploded just because, uh, these are the three that you're going to want to know. And you oftentimes, for really bad hand injuries, you will do them in conjunction with each other. You just do them all at the same time. These are smaller injections, they're three to five cc's, but there's a lot of anatomical variance from patient to patient as to what each of these nerves will actually cover. So just do them or, you know, I would just do them all. If you're going to do something complicated with somebody's hand, if you have a lack uh, that needs to be repaired or if they have a bad injury. Uh, this is where I mentioned earlier that you may want to play really nice in the sandbox with your uh, consultants. You might want to let ortho or plastics or whoever's on for hand know that this is going to happen. You do these kind of in the mid forearm and sometimes you'll get some distal forearm cover and like, you know, anesthesia with it. Uh, so oftentimes they may want to examine the patient after a hand injury to see what they can move and how they can move it. So they can assess all the different ligaments and strength for all the different digits. Uh, so it may be best, depending on the situation, to let them see the patient before you do it. So that's my main disclaimer with about, you know, agreements with other specialties. So again, you're going to have your same, a lot of your same equipment, but you don't need quite as much. So this one you can do on your own. You don't need an assistant. You have your machine. You just need a probe cover, something to clean it with, 10cc syringe, and just a standard 25 gauge needle is what I use. So where do we look for all the different nerves? So our median nerve is gonna give us this coverage. And I do all these kind of mid forearm. 
and this is what you're going to see. It's a little triangle in the middle of the arm. That's the easiest way to describe it. And fairly often, like I, looking on my, I looked on myself, I looked on some of my friends. Uh, it looks pretty similar in every patient that I've looked at. Uh, you have a your conglomerate of, mu of forearm muscles, and then the the fascial planes combine in the middle of the arm, and they give you this kind of triangular shape. So all you need to do is put a needle next to it. Uh, you just drop your needle down, and you can see previously, they, this person put their needle right here. You could do it right next, a little you know, further away from the bundle if you wanted, uh, but you just put your needle next to it and inject your local. Again, three to five cc's, that's all. So, I mean, it's so basic. You just, it's again, it's knowing where to look. That's all you have to do is know where to look. And the more you practice it, the better you're gonna get. So your radial nerve, uh, a same level, mid forearm. This one's important to do more proximal and not distal because everyone uh, for the kind of proximal part of the thumb, the innervation for some people comes off a lot more proximal than others. So if you're gonna do this, definitely be sure to be mid forearm. Uh, also what you'll see as you become more proximal, your artery and your nerve will separate. So if you go closer to your wrist, they kind of ride in tandem together. But you can watch it if you start in your wrist, if you don't know how to find, the, if you're like, I don't know where the, the nerve is, find the artery, real easy to find, and just slide back. And you'll see it slowly separate out. And again, you just come from whatever side is closest and opposite the artery, so you don't risk puncturing or going through the artery. Put your needle next to it, three to five cc's of local. These are quick and easy. You can do all three of these in five minutes. It takes longer to get your supplies than it does to, to actually do this. So your ulnar nerve, you're just gonna have the patient rotate their arm. You kind of come from a more posterior aspect. This is what you're gonna see. This one, the nerve does ride next to the artery. So you just come from uh, more posteriorly to avoid the artery. Just put your needle right next to it, three cc's after a negative aspiration. All right, so still with the arm, my favorite block. Um, just did one last week, a patient had fallen down, had bad humerus fracture, bad elbow fracture, had forearm fractures. It's so a whole bunch of fractures in their arm. So this is, for that scenario, it's the perfect block. They also do these, uh, anesthesia does these for people that have like AV fistula repairs or revisions. Uh, a lot of times I'll do those just under this and that's it. Uh, it is a little more uh, fine. So maybe you know if you're just getting started at doing these, don't jump into this one right away. And then it does spare the axilla. So this is not something you can do if someone say has like hydratinitis and they have axillary abscesses or something like that. Uh, this is not gonna cover that. Again, your cartoon drawing. So you're looking above the clavicle, uh, kind of right here. And you're gonna find your first rib and your subclavian artery. Next to that, you find what I, what I view as like a little slice of pizza. That's what it looks like to me. Uh, but most things look like pizza. And you do have to do two injections because this is the brachial plexus on whatever side you're at. And it has six different cords at this level. Uh, there are fascial planes that separate these cords. Uh, there's always one here between the, mo the lowest one. And most often there is one here as well. Uh, so your first injection is gonna be kind of right above your first rib. Uh, so this is without injection, and that's your brachial plexus. So you have your artery, your middle scalene, and then your your slice of pizza here. To me, it just looks like pepperoni pizza. So your needle is going to come from here, on the, away from the artery, down to your first rib. Your first injection is going to be about 10 cc's right there, and that will cover your lower cords. The second injection you can either do by taking the needle and putting it right in the middle of these other five cords, or you can just do it right on top. There's no evidence to suggest that one way is better than the other. So that's where I am for. 
So this is your positioning. So you have the patient turn their head if they can. Uh, this is really, if they're in a C collar, this is really hard to do. Uh, so we had to, the other day we had to wait for the patient's C spine to be cleared. Uh, so you have them turn their head. You, everyone is obviously a little different. So you just put it right on top of the clavicle fan a little bit until you see your middle scaling, your artery, and then your little bundle of nerves right in the middle. And once you see that, uh, you're good to go. And this is pretty superficial as well. So your the, the pleura is right below that first rib. So you're you're often not going in very far, and it's a pretty shallow angle. All right. So those are the core blocks that I like to do in the emergency department, and I've done throughout the year. What local do you use? There's a decent debate about this, uh, at least I didn't know there was, but one of our trauma surgeons likes bupivacaine a lot. And she had asked me to what you know local I was doing. And I said, oh, I use ropivacaine. She said, oh, no, I would like if you could use bupivacaine, please. So why ropivacaine over bupivacaine? Um, bupivacaine is more cardiotoxic, it's more lipophilic, and it has a lower maximum allowable dose two versus three milligrams. So the that coupled with the similar kind of duration of action, ropivacaine is a choice for me every time. You can get used, you know, 0.2% or 0.5% ropivacaine, and your total dose that you can give people is, in terms of volume, is much higher. So if you're doing these large plain blocks that you're going to do 30, you know, 40 cc's of local, uh, definitely recommend using ropivacaine to try to avoid uh, any uh, light, like local anesthetic systemic toxicity. So this is a little chart that I have in our in that nerve kit that I showed you. I have this chart in there. It's on the back of the paper that lists the supplies for the cart uh, for the bag. Uh, that way, your users or you know your 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 fellow you know, docs don't have to worry about what am I doing? Am I giving this patient too much or too little? Uh, so those are the main concentrations to use and those are the volumes that you can instill and at a maximum dose. So, I mean, if you have multiple fractures, you can use 0.2% and you can do multiple blocks uh, because not many people are 50 kilograms anymore. Uh, typically they're a little bigger. All right, so the worry, the, you can't really talk about nerve blocks without knowing how to treat the, you know, the feared complication of is last. So mainly you're going to get this impending doom and then the tox triad of seizure coma death, uh, which ends almost every toxicity that I've ever heard of. Uh, a lot of people will also complain initially about some like perioral sensations or numbness and tingling. Uh, and then what people die from heart block, uh, they prolong QRS, right? Because all these medications work on sodium channels. Uh, and your solution is 20% intralipid. Uh, you can give a bolus, and if the bolus doesn't help improve your uh, patient's you know, hemodynamics or heart block, then you can start an infusion as well. If you're doing this, typically, uh, I know where, you know where I used to work, it was toxicology would be involved. Uh, but not all places have that. Some places are have a poison center. Uh, so if this is happening, you're giving a bolus, hopefully you're in contact with those people uh, to make sure that uh, you have all the help you can get. Uh, two things that you can do for local is I still to this day, no matter how many times I've tried, learning how to calculate doses of point two quarter percent, this medication, that medication, how much local can someone have? Uh, they are getting local for their laceration repairs as well. There's these two apps, uh, MD Calc and um, this app from John Hopkins about local anesthetic uh, talk, like calculation, dose calculations. Uh, they're great. Uh, they both work really well. You can choose any local that you're under the sun, put in how much you're giving them or how much they've received already. It'll tell you they can have this much of this, or that, or this, and all the different you know, options in between. So this is, these are both apps that I have on my phone uh, for a quick reference, 
don't, you know, don't waste your brain space memorizing these things. All right. So those are the, that's it. Uh, this first thing, hopefully you all do it, is a tribute to my friends from residency. Uh, hopefully Tim and Phil in particular, take a look at that. And then maybe you did or maybe you didn't. But this is the actual mobile support. The first one was uh, a nice video of Rick Astley. So these are things that you can like home. I have these saved in my uh, Safari on my phone as like hot pages. So I can just one click and get there. Um, so these are the techniques from different websites that you can have quick access to uh, the fascia iliaca and the serratus anterior plane, uh, and then the, all the different forearm blocks uh, for the main sources that I used to kind of come up with all this. And there's a bunch of stuff here. 